Hey everybody, I am so glad to see you tonight and the morning or the afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. Today has been an extraordinary Monday, incredibly busy. I think for all of us, as we were chatting in the green room, it, it really became apparent that how amazing is it that we can do so much and be so connected to everybody that's really far away. And, and that was one of the things that I was actually grateful and blessed for today in terms of being able to stay in touch with not only my family and my friends, but to also cultivate the relationships that I am building both personally and professionally with the vast distances. So with that, I want to say thank you, welcome, and we're going to roll the open. Roll, roll, roll the open. And it's always, huh, it is always a high drama. And when it's live like this, we just cross our fingers. That, that was, was really awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, David, Scott, hello. Hi, Jess. Hi, David. Welcome. Yes, welcome. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited to be here, actually. Um, you know, I like I like this really free-flowing script where things just happen, and I think this is really exciting because, you know, it sort of makes me um, think of my toes. And, and, and what makes you think that this is unscripted? <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! Okay. You you might not know what you're in for. Uh, probably that, not. But I'm, uh, yeah. I'm looking we actually to... do a lot of planning to make it look completely unscripted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how have your how have your days been? Um, we found out, David, that you are still awake. You're going to you 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 might take a power nap soon, but so your day hasn't quite ended yet. And Scott, your day is is in the same place that mine is with our with being in the same time zone. So how have your days been today? Oh, it's been pretty morning actually. It started at a 9 o'clock meeting and unfortunately I was working over the weekend so I went to bed at 4. So I was pretty short of sleep when I got to the meeting you know, and I had a coffee straight away when I got there. It was really funny because they say, hi, how are you doing? I said, great. I said, is any coffee going? That was my first words. <laughs> I must have thought it odd. Um, and it's almost five o'clock now. I, it's, it is five o'clock actually in the morning. So it's been pretty long, but you know it feels really productive, which is amazing. And I absolutely love this kind of feeling. You have days when you can sort of do things and you get tired, but you know it, it, everything's very. Um, you feel you're sort of actually making progress in what you're doing, which is excellent. It sounds like you live in the moment, actually. <laughs> That's very zen. Well, I, I try to. I try. You know, I have this rule about how many. Which sounds weird. How many thousands of hours we have left on the planet? And you know, I think I figured I would have about I have about thirty thousand hours left. So every hour that goes, it's gone, right? It's a countdown. You know, so, I have a friend who count who celebrated my one millionth minute being alive, but I've never thought about it the way you just did. Where how many hours do I have left? I'm gonna have to calculate that later. Yeah. So I think you know, every hour that goes by, if I don't do something which is which is meaningful, you know, even if I do nothing, if it gives me something and it helps me recharge or think, then that's great. But to do something to, you know, to waste it simply because perhaps it's conventional, perhaps people expect it, well, I don't do that anymore. So there you go. Right on. You know, one, one of the questions I was going to ask at some point, maybe this is a good time, is that I, I look at some of the posts that you have and it's you're always able to tie it back, I suppose, to semantic search and whatnot, but it's just amazing the depth and the breadth of the sort of information that you're that you're able to bring to bear. Yeah. Every day, is it kind of like a play, is it like a sandbox for you? Do you feel like you're in a perpetual state of, of play and, and school and this is like better than going to a community college? Yes, well, I feel, you know, one of the things I missed about university um, when I left was the fact that 
we had, I did chemical engineering, and we know you can talk about quantum mechanics and electro electrodynamics and maths, and, and, and we used to sort of stay up till very late or very early in the morning discussing the implications of quantum mechanics, which are philosophically, they're fundamentally mind-blowing. And, you know, you leave that environment, you don't get that anymore. And, you know, you go to work and you talk, of, talk about spreadsheets and pie charts and businesses and, and money and profit margins. And I, it, we come here, you know, 21st century, this kind of environment where you can actually combine the two. And I think this is truly liberating because, you know, you don't have to sort of curtail the power of your mind and your imagin imagination. And the fact, that, you know, the, the excitement we felt as children even when you, the world is new and things are happening, well, we're feeling that again now, and I, I love it. You know, it's the kind of thing that sort of keeps me going. So you were talking to us in the green room about how the catalyst of what started you down this path. And, you know, as an author, you have several books besides the Semantic Search book. And I am curious what... P.S. Scott, that's your cue. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm working. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, how did you know that each of your books needed written? How? What was the, you know, was it the time? Was it an inspiration? How did each yeah. one of those come about? That's a brilliant question because here's what I think. I mean, you know, usually writers tell you they write the book they want to have to read. And I think, you know, when you're writing fiction, I think it's brilliant because you need to be a storyteller telling a story to yourself first. But you get into nonfiction, and then you come back to the, you know, why is the book, why is the book there? And every book needs to answer something. And every book I wrote actually had, in, the intent was to answer something very specific. There was a question there which was being asked and not answered adequately enough. And that's what sort of leads me to put a book together. Um, and, and that's how I usually pass it to my agent who tells me, okay, what question is this answering now? And who's the audience? And we go, we take it from there. So uh, we're displaying on our uh, display screen some of your book. Uh, uh, do you have any comments that you'd like to make about them as, as they uh, come into view? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the story of how the very first one came out because um, I, you know, the SEO help, and this is like its fourth iteration now, but it was the first book I actually, um, the first business book I actually wrote. Um, and I was working uh, with a studio at the time, a web design studio, and I was leading their SEO team. I was uh, helping them out put together the processes which needed to sort of connect in a more professional basis with their clients. And we got a client from Texas, and I had a really long discussion with him, and you know, he had been spending a lot of money every month for SEO. Now, 2010, the words SEO themselves were like abracadabra. You evoked some kind of magic, and things happened. And uh, I sort of... Uh, you know, I was having this discussion. He said, you know, we're not really getting anywhere. Um, and the reports we're getting from our SEO agency are pretty bad. I said, okay. I said, you know, um, let me see what I can do. And then I checked it out. And his website was zero, literally zero. He was not getting any kind of traction at all because it's in PDF at the time converted to JPEGs on the web. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, and I thought, okay, you will have a lot of room for improvement here. That was the good news. And then he sent me uh, one of the reports that the agency had sent him. And, you know, they sort of listed a number of things which they did in order to justify their fee. And it was about 10 things. And the 10th one was writing this report, which really incensed me. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, he shouldn't be spending money on this. You know, the report should, the, the, the money, the time spent writing the report shouldn't be part of the cost. It's ridiculous. So it incensed me so much. I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is put together a 20-step guide, no theories, that's explanation. Sit down and do it if you're a website owner, and that'll get you, at the time, to Google's first page. And it, it worked, because I tested everything. So that's how it all started out. And obviously, I took it to the um, to my agent, who said, you know, I don't think there's a market for SEO books. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no. <laughs> yeah, um, go figure. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I said, well, you know, why don't you shop it around? And um, she did. and. Then um, it went to sort of several publishers, and the reply was, "Do you think this is really going to sell? Because it sounds very technical." I said, "You know, it isn't. Trust me. Okay, this is the kind of thing." And and they took a chance on me at the time, um, and they said, "Okay, let's try it." 
and they did. And it, and you know, it went. Um, it was on bestseller lists in Amazon in three countries for about fourteen months solid. So wow! It was really good. That, yeah. What a great launch for your first <laughs> yeah. book. It was. It was really exciting. So I thought, okay, I thought you know, what, that what, became that became a platform. What was the biggest surprise in terms of writing it? Uh, the the amount of uh, emails I got at the time, and you got to remember, 2010 um, was not really a very social media savvy time. You know, we had Facebook, but Facebook was very closeted in a way. So I I wrote the book, and um, I, at the time I had a website called um, HelpMySEO.com, which was basically the platform for the book and myself. And I started getting emails at the rate of, I mean, started off at the rate of 20 or 30 a week, and then sort of escalated to a few hundred. And I was shocked because, you know, I, I was, you know, I'm a journalist by training in many ways. I was used to the distance between the writer and the author, uh, the writer and the reader. And I, you know, used to bang out an article, go in a newspaper or magazine. Readers would get it, but you know, nobody would, you wouldn't get any feedback except from your editor. So um, suddenly, it brought me very close to the to the audience, and then I realized their needs were a lot more. Um, Practical, a lot more real. You know, you understand the impact you have, and that, that puts you on a certain watch as well, because you realize that okay, you're not just writing a book. You're writing something somebody's going to pay a relatively small amount of money for, in the real hope that it's going to make a difference to their working life, and they depend on that working life to make a living. And that really sort of sharpened and focused my mind, really, in terms of responsibility. So, so do you think you would have gone on the path that you have were it not for the experience of getting the influx of emails on the early social of uh, social media in writing Pro this book? Um, probably not. I, you know, I mean, uh, before I actually got to write SEO help, I've been thinking about writing a book for a long, long time because because I've been doing writing, writing comes easy. So you think, yeah, I need to put it down in a book sometimes. And you really need. A, re a real reason beyond the I want to make money or I am good at writing reason. Um, and that, the kind of injustice or the sense of injust injustice I felt seeing how that guy had been ripped off for over a year really ticked me off. And I thought, okay, we can address this. And then I sort of, every book I write tends to demystify something, give you, empower you as a reader to actually do something which you couldn't before. And, and that's the value that is there for me. And do you have any books in the pipeline that you'd like to share, or is that a top secret? <laughs> it's a top secret one at the moment, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So anyway, this is uh, terrific. What's the, what's the Fox book? I, I, sh I should have done more research. The Social Media Mind? Oh yes, um, that that happened pretty much as social media is taking off, and you know we're thinking why. Um, I looked at why social media is so disruptive, and at the time I was I had a lot of um, case studies of my corporate clients facing huge problems, which led me to go back and analyze the dynamic because you know social media sort of snuck up on us. Suddenly we were there, we were using it, and we thought, okay, this is what it is. And the Arab Spring happened, the London riots happened, they were all blamed on social media. So when you see this kind of disruption happening across societies across the globe, and you know, it happens in countries where you have repressive regimes, and it happens in countries where you have allegedly democracy, and then the heads of state in both sort of sets of countries come out with very similar language, I kid you not, where they talk about restricting access to social media and restricting civil rights and restricting citizens' rights, you think, okay, hold on a sec, something is going on here. And the rhetoric coming out of the UK following the London riots of 2011, I think, uh, or the summer of, two, uh, yeah, 2011, was pretty much mirroring something the Soviet Union had said before that, that China had said before that, and what um, regimes were saying across the Arab countries, which, which were experiencing a lot of unrest. And you think, well, this is not the kind of thing which happens by accident. It reflects a much deeper reaction to something which is very real and very dynamic, which is experienced by everybody at the same level. And that became the, the sort of the kernel for the book, really. Wow. You know, it, it seems like social media and uh, especially Google+, Plus, Google communities are less than a year old. 
as an example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> which is incredible. That it's that it's racing faster than what the traditional institutions can catch up. It's it's like wow, you know. And where did this come from? It came out of out of left field, uh, almost making it uh, the power to the people because uh, we're we're agile enough to be able to take advantage of it and and what. What are the um, what are the how are the institutions responding to this? Um, I think you, huh. you you gave a little bit of the answer there. Are they going to be able to catch up and then reshape and do, do the regulatory thing they normally do, or is the cat out of the box? Well, there's certainly a fear that governments can use technology a lot better than us because they can scale it better. They may be slower at catching up, but they have the budgets and they have the know-how and they have the people and the institutions to implement it in ways which can be very restrictive across a wider scale than ever. There's a, there's a certain, I mean, as a fear, it is very real and very valid. The question has to arise that because of the access we have as people, that is a huge power. I mean, the power always resided with the people. If we go back to, you know, medieval feudal times, you know, you had the a small cadre of, of armed troops living in your castle and you had all the serfs under your, your thumb, but as long as the serfs were individual serfs working in your fields, you could do pretty much what you liked. If they all banded together and got their pitchforks and their torches, well, then you didn't stand a chance. People power did actually rule even back then, although in a very destructive way. And, and that sort of created a few lines which couldn't be crossed. I think with the um, wider access of, of, uh, of social media to everybody, we're getting into a very disruptive period. Um, where nothing is very clear so far. The balance of power lies on both sides. Um, what we see in terms of restrictions being applied by the government, even the latest NSA uh, surveillance thing and the Snowden revelations, uh, to my mind, these are just the old guard fighting a desperate rear battle because that's what they are actually there to do. I mean, that's how they're, they, the system we have helped put in place is intended to react. So this is perfectly understandable. So in a way, this may be the, phase, the transitionary phase to a world where you know we do away with countries in the traditional sense because they're really no longer necessary, they are anachronism. We do away with barriers in the traditional sense and hopefully we do away with governments in the traditional sense because at the end of the day we don't need a government to tell us our ideology, we can work it out ourselves. We don't need a government to tell us whether we're left, right, or we should believe in, in, in any kind of God or not. We can do that ourselves. What we need a government for is to run the country. And, and you know, that's that actually is a really interesting point, and, and some of the things that you said, if you go back a little farther than 2010, used to appear on Star Trek, right? This was our, <laughs> this was our vantage point of what could our future hold and what yes. could some of this ideal wonderfulness be, and it sounds like we're on this path of actually realizing some of that, maybe just in a different way than the sci-fi way, right? A very... Yeah. People to yeah. people, very real. Isn't that amazing? Because you're absolutely right. I mean, if I'd said the same thing five years ago or seven years ago, when I actually didn't think that allowed anymore back then, um, it is. It sounds like science fiction. And now we actually can see. We actually can see a path. And we can see a dynamic that can make it happen. And that is staggering. We've gone into the realm of um, creating a world which was shaped by our dreams expressed through fiction in many ways. Uh, that's, that's amazing to me. What is, what is conversational search if it's not uh, the Star Trek computer, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wrote about that in my book, actually. And, you know, you, you look at Captain Kirk, and he just says, or you look at the Captain Picard, and he says, computer, and he just calls out. And, you know, you think, okay, who is this computer? You know, obviously, when you think about it, you think the computer must have sensors, the computer must have memory, it must learn, it must put everything together. It must constantly monitor, in a way, which is a bit scary, everybody in the crew. So when the captain says, Computer, what's happening out there? He knows that you know it's talking about the photon torpedoes coming towards him, and the shields being at sixty percent, and the invisibly cloaked new version of the enemy being out there. And he says, "Oh, you know, we have this kind of enemy out there." <laughs> and he tells you this all the time. You think, "Okay, what an amazing computer! How can we get hold of one of those?" Well, there you go. We've got Google now. <laughs> well, I, I I had a little bit of a revelation the other day. 
I would love to get your reaction to it, and this might be a good point to interject it, and that is that a lot of innovations in society come from the military, and yet uh, if, you, if you think of what Google and Google Plus is doing as innovation in society and the revolution, it doesn't have its core in the military. How does that change the dynamics of what's going on, do you think? Well, doesn't that reflect the shift that's going away? It's going away from the change being driven by the verticals we used to believe in, the institutions, church, government, military, because they had the means and the methodology. And we were disorganized. And distributed computing, the PC revolution, the internet and the access we got, actually allowed us to become a little bit better organized. And that created a momentum of its own. And that basically, and, and, and this is a nice seg segue into semantics essentially, because the noise of connectivity became a signal for change. And this is what semantics is at its core, is that essentially the moment you connect all these people together, even if it is something ridiculous like sharing lol cuts, it actually means something. It, it creates a shared cultural experience, which is then it begins to power something else. Because if they connect culturally across the globe sharing stupid jokes, then they begin to break down the barriers of you know, we're separated by religion, separated by ethnicity, separated by country, separated by language, and then we're united by being people. And this leads us back to the discussion how the world is changing into the Star Trek world where we are Earth, populated by people, first, and everything else second. This is the dynamic which actually has been put in place. And Google, in many ways, is an expression of this. They are essentially a people-powered company as opposed to a government-powered one or a, a, a military-powered one, doing what what reflects people's needs. They basically do pretty much what we want, what we need. I know it doesn't feel that way, but um, I had an interesting discussion at SMX East in New York with uh, Dwayne Forrester, who is the product manager of Bing. And he said, um, search engines go where the people go. You know, you want quality information, for instance, on this or the other thing, but you know, this is not what people want. They want, um, you know, they want to know about Justin Bieber. They want to know about the latest the latest sports thing. And that's where the masses go. That's where you're going to see the greatest change in quality, the greatest change in indexing, because this is what people ask. You may want to do an academic search, and you're thinking, I'm getting really rubbish results. Well, I said, you know, it'll get better, but it'll get better last, because very few people ask for that. And I thought that was telling in many ways, because, again, it's people-powered. I mean, everything we see is powered by us. So if we drive search, and we drive technology from our needs, our perceived needs by them, and then the moment they give us something, we repurpose that and we do something else with it. And that creates a different dynamic. And it goes on and on. And we never had that before. It used to be the government used to give you something. The military used to give you some kind of technology saying, you know, you can use that now. You would have wanted. So knowing so, we're at this place now, right? We're at this we're at this place now. We never really thought we would be at, we dreamt about, and just within the last few years we're here. What does that mean? five years from now or I have a two and a half year old when he becomes an adult you know or when his kids are starting to experience the world what d does that change the game for how we think about the future or does it just give us a different picture of the future I think the two are related because essentially how we think about the future is informed by how we are a former world view in the present and how we do that right now is both scary and full of hope and excitement. It's scary because this is the 21st century in the full sense of the word. We're experiencing problems we've never faced before. We're experiencing issues we don't know how to deal with. We don't know how to, what to do about security, privacy, the flow of information, control, and command structures which are collapsing. We don't know how to trust the government we used to trust and the banks we used to trust in the past. We know things have to change. And we can't erase everything and start from scratch because obviously that's going to take us back to the Stone Age. So we're sort of ambling along step at a time, doing exciting things, and we hope that as we move forward, we will collectively work it out. And I think this is the, the, the children growing up now are more proficient at this and better at perhaps dealing with the uncertainty than we are. Um, classic example is Facebook, for instance, where as adults, we, you know, we used to find it a little bit weird. We connected with friends, we connected with school friends, and then we became a bit worried about privacy. And now we're saying, okay, everything you do on Facebook is going public and shouldn't. And at the same time, teens who are 
abandoning Facebook and going to Tumblr. However, when they are on Facebook, they're incredibly good at keeping their private and their um, public lives in check. And they know how to control it. And they do it instinctively. They don't have a strategy. They just know. And I think, you know, this is, they, they're true digital citizens. And we sort of had to learn this. Um, and, you know, that instinctive behavior is only going to become more so as we become um, as, as we become more embedded in a technological world and the technology actually becomes more invisible in parts of our lives. So that's the world we're heading towards. I think that is just incredibly cool. And one of the things that really resonated with me that you said was talking about how we get to do it together. We, we have the opportunity to be connected and collaborate in ways that may not have been as easy before because we could only collaborate with our neighbors or the people that we worked with or the people we happen to have relationships with, right? Or travel to see at a conference or, or whatever the case may be. And, and that piece of it is neat. The other piece is we all have a purpose here. And what our purpose is is just so amazing to be able to know that we can find it, connect, and share something of value and find like minded people. There, I, I guess we don't need, we all have our own closets, whatever your belief system is. We all have things we like to keep in there. Maybe we don't need to keep it in there as much because we now have a new way to connect with people. That's, that's very true. And I think um, what you just said, I mean, essentially, if we think of people as, as little boxes, and you never really know 100% what's in the box, you do know, however, that if you leave the box alone, you'll never find out. You know, it could be one it like Schrodinger's box. It could be of value, it could be not. The cat could be alive, it could be dead. It's a very sort of quantum uncertainty. And by connecting, we actually collapse the probability wave to a huge extent. And that's where the value comes from. Um, I know from myself, I mean, the, the excitement I felt when I connected to my readers through email in the first instance was fantastic. And it sort of has grown ever since. You know, social network has enabled people to get in touch with me. And actually, you know, a classic example is Google Semantic Search. When I wrote it, you know, I had the idea I need to write this book. I didn't really, you know, the subject is huge. And I spent 18 months going through academic papers, researching stuff so that I could actually get a really deep handle on it. The book I had in mind, because this is the propensity I have sometimes, I, I love the intellectual purity of mathematics, so it was going to be a lot more academic because, you know, I was trying to explain semantic search. And what I started doing, because it felt really lonely writing all this, you know, you're working all hours of the day in a, in a basically a cubicle, right, which is surrounded by your research. So I started putting snippets and ideas on Google+. And I got tremendous response. People started sharing, adding their own thoughts, adding their own ideas, adding their own, and that changed entirely the way and the direction my book was heading towards. I thought, okay, you know, this, being academic probably makes me feel good about it, but it, it's not really going to appeal very much because it's not very practical. So I sort of went back to the drawing board and pretty much redrew the entire concept of the book. So when you actually see Google Semantic Search, in many ways, it's been collaboratively written with all the people who um, generously gave me their time and ideas and energy in Google Plus and shared that with me. And that shows that left to myself, that little box, which is perhaps David Amortland, the value of what was going to come out of that would have been a lot less had it not been for the connection. And I think by connecting, we help realize each other's values. They, whatever ideas we have in our heads, they sync, whatever knowledge we have, generously shared, makes a difference to everybody else. And that sort of goes all around the network. And, and Google Plus is unique in actually making this happen. I think we didn't have it before, the excitement we feel being here every day. Uh, it's unrivaled. You know, I try to explain to people who are not here, and it sounds like I'm on drugs. So I don't tell them <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, oh, go ahead, Scott. Well, I was just going to say, we, we were planning this for later, but uh, Jess, would, oh, would you look in the chat and say yes or no? Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Go this ahead. A, it's a production meeting, right? Going on behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. Eric, love you're, it. You're, you're not allowed to look in the chat. Okay. You, you actually are allowed to look in the chat if you want. We decided we okay. can't hide all the details from the people watching us and the people joining us. So you get to see all the cords and all of the stuff that we might trip on and I was, you know, all that good I stuff. I was just people. kidding. I was just kidding. You can do whatever you want, David. You are our well, honored okay, guest. But you know, the, there is a good segue into... So let's... Have any, has anybody 
Scott asked some questions or anything about this because we're transitioning into the semantic search piece of our conversation. And I know we had one question submitted before the show started, and I didn't know if any more had come up that we should talk we've about. Had some, we've had some nice comments, but we haven't had any uh, specific questions. But I can decided not to do the comment tracker for a variety of reasons, but I might be able to kind of cheat here and bring up the question. Would that be a good idea? Yeah, Would yeah, you absolutely. like that? Yeah, if you want, absolutely. Or so, I've got it in the chat, so we can just read it verbatim. Well, it's in the it's in the uh, it's in the screen. It's it's. Oh, let's do it. Yeah, kind of, here it comes. Okay. Kind of low tech. It's a screen capture, but Heather Crafter asks, "I want to know how or why to use hashtags in this new world of semantic search." Hope you will address this one. Perfect. Okay, taxonomy, which is essentially the ability to classify. Um, objects, words, content is really important in semantic search because it actually helps search when it actually when it indexes um, information to better understand the cluster it should go into. Uh, you probably have noticed that Google has implemented auto automatic hashtags in some of the comments um, that it understands. It does that for a reason and the reason is again because you can easily it, in a little better way index the um, posts we put up or, and understand their importance in terms of the content and the intent and the, the deeper value. So to answer the question specifically, yes, you should always use hashtags for very specific reasons. Perhaps you're doing a subject which you want to be identified with. You can use that to actually link all your content. Um, you may want to start a campaign. You want all the content related around the campaign. Again, you can do that. The proviso here is that hashtags that are person generated can be overused like keywords in the past. We used to stuff keywords everywhere. So use it judiciously. Use it so that you can actually help surface value as opposed to I'm using it blindly because it's a cool promotional tool. And the reason for this is that the cool promotional tool idea is going to backfire eventually. And they, I'm using it so I can deliver value to an audience and help search understand better what I do will actually pay off. So be your own uh, sort of policeman in this, if you like and use them uh, selectively. Well, and you know, that leads into, let's touch on some things related to content. So when we're talking about hashtags and we're talking about being able to help index and categorize our own content, and then of course other people's reaction to that or non-reaction to that is actually going to give us the credibility over time is what I think you were alluding to. So what does that mean for our content? Does that make our content more important or less important? Well, um, if we consider the fact that content essentially is the way that people begin to identify who you are and what you do, the moment you, um, and we're getting here into a little bit of the corporate discussions I have with large clients we're talking about corporate content, and I usually tell them, know what you have and know how to use it. And that's sort of lingo they understand, but when we translate into everyday speech is know why you're doing something and then Dis discover for yourself what's the best way to actually project that in terms of the, of the value you have. So when it comes to content, you need to know what is it that you have to do that you actually project? What are you doing? Are you, for instance, a company or a person who's trying to create brand awareness? Are you trying to promote specific products? Are you trying to promote specific services? Are you trying to simply create a website that will have a lot of traffic with the idea that at some point you'll find a way to actually monetize it? Now, all of these are valid concerns, but <clears throat> what you need to do in every case is deliver value because if you know what you have and you know how to use it, you also know who is going to use it. You know your target audience. And if you know your target audience, there's absolutely no excuse for not delivering value which answers the specific questions and concerns. And that's where the new disrupt in content creation comes in. You used to create content around keywords. Why? Because keywords responded in search because search engines used to look for them first. So we used to start the day saying, okay, I need to create 400 words around the keyword uh, book and SEO, for instance. And you used to go, you know, writing book, SEO, SEO book, SEO books, search engine optimization books, books and search, you know, you used to be able to do that in a ridiculous way. It didn't matter very much if somebody reading it all thought, okay, you know, this is really thin, it's trying to do something because what you wanted is search to actually bring up your site so somebody could go there. And then you'd think, okay, having beer on my site, now they're going to basically do something, which I hope they will do. 
It doesn't and work that way anymore. No, Not it anymore. doesn't. And I think what you were talking about for knowing your customer it really is the key piece because that's what everybody that I talk to, when we are, whatever we're exploring, it turns out like, well, I don't know if I really want to know who I'm talking to because then I actually have work to do. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, it is the hard work, but it's the work that's going to get you paid. And, you know, it's going to get you whatever your objective is in payment, right? Is it to become, is it, is it to give back to the community? Is it to increase your sales? Is it to reach more people? Is it to achieve, you know, whatever the uh, objectives are? And I find that to be an interesting phenomenon right now. It is. <laughs> if we, excuse me, if we take that into the field of writing, I mean, yeah, you're right. It's hard work. I mean, how much easier would it be when, you know, we had to go back in the 80s and 90s when to get a book published, you had to get your picture to your agent, to your agent, who would pitch it to the publisher, who would just say yes or no, thinking, okay, it's going to make money or it's not. The reader didn't really come into it. Everybody thought, okay, I'm writing for the reader. Obviously, the writer would say, no, I think people need to read this. And the agent would say, well, maybe you're right. And the publisher would say, oh, I'm pretty sure they will read it if it's in the bookshops. And they would pull it out. And now it's, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of, every idea I put together myself, I'm thinking, okay, is there an audience for this in terms of really a lot of people who will gain value from this? And if I can't convince myself first, that there's a huge audience out there. I don't sort of put it together in a book idea. And my agent, thank goodness, also thinks the same way. Publishers are a little bit sort of still slow catching up. You know, they begin, they begin to realize that readers will only connect with a book if it really connects with them. So they're beginning to change a little bit. And I think that is, you know, that's really awesome to see it changing multiple industries, right? So every everybody who is joining us tonight, I can say, most I would say most of them are probably early adopters. They love Google Plus. We've all committed to the power and the benefits of it. But you know, to to be able to take this to somebody else and say, you know, doing good work is hard work, and that's the reward because we're mastering our skill. We're figuring out what our message actually is and what resonates with the people around us in a positive, beneficial way. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the thing is, being good and working hard, it's, it's new to us because we spent the last hundred years thinking all we need is technology to scale things up and then real nice packaging to sell it to people. And we became lazy in that respect. The Industrial Revolution, which freed us from an agricultural society, also created huge blind spots. It allowed us to think, okay, all I need now, for instance, to, to sell, I don't know, a million copies of something is I need to advertise heavily enough across all these verticals, spend X amount of money, and I'll get back the million, co million copy sales that I need. And, mm -hmm. and to some extent in the past, it used to work that way because our trust points where we actually gained um, access to information we trusted were controlled by central points in the media. There was TV and radio and magazines and newspapers and everything consumed through those points because it was cost expensive, we assumed is also quality. You know, we used to wear brands, for instance, blindly thinking, okay, it's a brand. It's going to be high quality. It's going to be higher quality than the stuff produced, you know, in my local market. We know this is not the case. We know that everything's made in China, <laughs> regardless. <laughs> that's so, awesome. That's but awesome. So really, that's, that's changed the way we connect with quality. It is. Yeah. So there, there's a little bit of an underlying theme that's going through that's been popping through my head, and I'd like your reaction as well, uh, David. And that is, uh, is the internet and by, ex or I, I should phrase it this way, is Google by and by extension the internet inherently good? I think the internet and Google is a tool like a hammer or 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 a saw. And I don't think, I think it, it is wrong for us to say something is inherently good or inherently bad. What ascribes that kind of value to a tool is the use we make of it. And as people, now we have become a lot more accountable for our actions than in the past. And the only reason this has happened is because our actions now take place in a much more public domain than in the past. So, to, you know, on my own, I know that exercise is good for me. And I know that perhaps I shouldn't be eating pizza every day. But if nobody can see me, who cares? I can do that. I'm thinking I'm going to get better. But if you're, if you're, if you're, let's say you're on, on South Beach in Miami, 
and I've been there. It's an amazing place. People feel plastic. <laughs> just, they seem to be molded from different kind of, of the genetic material to the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so That's so funny. You, you go there and you know you see these ultra fit people doing incredible things in public. Totally, seemingly totally oblivious to anybody watching them. You know, you're not going to go out and buy a slice of pizza. You're thinking, where's my nearest carrot sticks sales supply? <laughs> <laughs> you know so, we have a huge audience in Florida, but go on. <laughs> well, I'm not actually. I'm saying this, this is a positive effect because it helps you make positive life choices, which you may not otherwise have done. But it just goes to show that you know the moment you're in a public arena, you actually behave differently because you're impacted by the dynamic. And I think this is you know the values of good or evil on things like the internet, email, social media, the connectivity amongst us is pretty much uh, ascribed to us by our social connections and what we socially accept as the right thing to do. And I think people are inherently good. Um, it, is, it, is, it is a lot more difficult to be bad in, a, in, a, in the conventional sense of the word, or evil even, than it is to be good. I completely agree with that. That that's that you might just have to come back so we can talk about that someday on our show. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't noticed, my role is to go over the top and go off into wild, and then Jess is the one who always brings it back down to, you know, down, okay. down to earth. So That's I funny. guess we make a good team. Yes, we do. And we're really glad to have you with us here, David. And I think we've been transitioning toward our plus two takeaway. So I wanted to check in with you, Scott, and see if there was anything else from our viewers that we should incorporate or talk about before we go that direction. Thank you. If you could blue box the uh, the display, uh, Ronnie Benzer has a question here and that is how has David found large versus small companies reacting to the concepts of semantic search? Ha, that is an excellent question. Okay, here's what it is. The challenge for both is exactly the same. Whether you're a small company or a large company, whether you're a single individual trying to essentially brand yourself to do something on the web. The challenge is doesn't change. What changes is the scale. But what is the challenge? The challenge is to actually create personal relationships. And actually, Ronnie was talking about that in a Hangout just before I, we joined here and I was, and was watching it. And he said, the, you know, Hangouts help create personal, you know, personal relationships because they break down barriers and they allow you to connect in a very immediate way. Uh, it, it sort of clears up a lot of misunderstandings. And he's absolutely right. It is an extremely powerful medium. Social media extremely, is, is extremely good at this. Uh, and, and Hangouts are extremely good at that and a social media tool. And the challenge of creating that relationship and creating that connection is the same across the board. How it is tackled, however, is totally different because the large clients I talk to obviously need a methodology. They need to a justification which is a lot more formal. They need to establish trust within their organization, which is not always there. And that is disruptive to them in, in many ways. So the smaller ones, they understand they need to be people first, business second. The bigger ones understand that they now need to become personal and personable, and they need to work differently. And the challenge they're facing is that they've been siloed into departments and command and control structures for so long that they need to change internally. We talk recently across the web about social business. And we think social business is something really cool because businesses are becoming socially aware, they're acquiring a conscience, and they're going to do better work in terms of the impact it has on the community and the planet than they have to date. And this is exactly what's happening, but it's not happening because it's a good thing to do. Business doesn't operate that way. Business operates on costs and expenses. To be good in that way, is really expensive. But as businesses become more personable and personal, they change internally. They break down the silos, they break down the processes, they put new personal processes in place. The moment you begin to mirror the network effect that you see outside, well, you also begin to be understand that you know, business is just people. And people are not bad. They all want the same thing. We all live on the same planet. We don't want to mess it up. We all want to have value in our lives. So what's really good about a business and what is really profitable for it at the end of the day is when its people inside it believe so strongly about what they do that they project it outside in such a way that it actually connects with their target audience. So by small degrees, 
trying to work in this new connected internet age, business is changing. Corporations as we know them are dying. They're becoming a true social business that reflects pretty much what we want them to do. Yeah. So you you earlier talked about uh, essentially putting words in your mouth, the death of the nation state, and now you're talking about the death of the traditional. This is a revolution. This is a good lead into something record. else. This is the first. I've never really been so open. Oh my God! Gonna hang out about this. So well, yeah. You 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 didn't you didn't know that that's why we call it the the Jess plus Scott plus you show because it's mm -hmm. really all about you. I want to show something on screen um, and uh, how can I phrase this? Will there? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and show this and then I and then I'll, I guess I'll follow it up. This is Circle uh, Counts um, uh, graph of the number of followers that you have. David and I, I'm sorry that I'm springing you on, uh, springing this on you, and I hope that you don't mind. But <laughs> you'll see that right around October, it has just, just got, gone skyrocketing. And I was uh, corresponding with uh, Ronnie Benser earlier, and he brilliantly thought, well, of course this is maybe the introduction of hummingbird, and people have become very you know, interested in that, so they're interested in what you have to say. I guess my question is, is this a tipping point, or do you see a point where we've been going along kind of normally, you know, it's kind of been flat for a while, but then do you see that change will happen very rapidly, not unlike what we see in this graph of the people who are interested in what you have to say? Yes, um, in a word, yes. I think, <clears throat> and I'm glad you brought this up because it, uh, I also noticed at the time. And what used to happen is, I, you know, I used to connect with people and had a very steady but relatively low growth, and then it sort of went through the roof. And there are a number of elements sort of con contributed to that. One of them was that I had um, a number of hangouts on air uh, to talk about semantic search, to talk about the impact of hummingbird, uh, and it, it sort of happened around the time the hummingbird was actually. Uh, very much um, being acknowledged by Google and there was tremendous interest because then they realized that semantic search is not going to go away, it's not a FUD, it is actually a real change which is going to impact us and it's sort of a, it, the interest connected and people are sort of um, expanded on the content and started sharing my content and my follower account sort of took off. That tipping point um, in many ways uh, reflects some of the issues and some of the um, subjects which are close to our hearts as people. We want, I mean, we love technology, but why? We love it because it allows us to do things we couldn't do before. But what we really love is its effects. We love the breaking down of barriers. We love the ability that we can do this kind of connection at any time of the day, pretty much, anywhere. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm in a totally different geographic zone and time zone to you, and we're talking and connecting like we're in the same room. and. It's actually a lot of fun and it's exciting and it's really exciting because we can do this. And you can see me, you can see my gestures, my expressions, where well, you can see whether I'm sort of, I have a script in front of me reading or not because, you know, you can tell the authenticity or the falseness of the connection. We used to do this only face to face in the past. We used to use it to do it only in our very small circles. Now we can do it globally. Now we can form a circle of friends which goes across the globe. This kind of empowerment really fires us up. This is what's behind it all. And this is the tipping point which we're going to experience in the very near future as semantic search becomes even broader, as the connections within Google Plus become deeper, as the signals which we are sending out now, which essentially guide our lives, become stronger. So to answer your question, it's a very long answer. The short answer is yes. Uh, no, the, thank you. And a follow-up question. Uh, will Google, with its predictive I mean, it's a, it, it, someone was saying the other day that they were near an airport and they opened up their iPhone and the predictive nature of uh, Google was the route was already there for the airport. Will, you know, will Google or will anyone be able to predict the, uh, the, this, this tipping point because they, they see enough, they, they connect, can connect enough, <laughs> enough dots to see it coming? Okay. Um. Yeah, the I mean, the moment you mention predictive search, you get to kind of two kinds of reactions. You get a lot of excitement, and you get a lot of fear, and they're both linked. Um, 
you know, little They're people exact can do opposite thing. emotions, which actually trigger the same brain chemical. I don't know if you knew that. Exactly. No, I didn't, but yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. what excites us also makes us afraid because it's part of change and brings in uncertainties and the unknown with it. So, you know, perfectly logical. I, I was just in a discussion very recently on a separate thread where, you know, somebody talked about predictive search and how predictable we are, and I said, we are. And they took umbrage to that, and I sort of had to leave because I thought this is not getting anywhere. Um, but <clears throat> essentially, um, Yes, they can, because they can mine signals across an entirety of spectrum, which allows predictive search to actually work. Google now works extremely well. And although we'd like to think we're very unpredictable, because inside our heads, everything is unique. Every moment is there. It's only happened just now. And we think, how can we possibly um, begin to, um, to be so predictable if people understand us? Or, or Google predicts what we'll do next. The thing is, our behavior across its breadth is, is actually very predictable. There's a routine to it. There's a pattern. There's things we like, things we don't like. We think they're new and unique. We think we have fresh ideas all the time because we, I mean, I, we can't even remember what we had for, for lunch on Thursday last week. But <laughs> Google knows. He knows, knows what you had, you know, provided you put it there. He knows what you had for lunch on Thursday five years before, or, you know, and which allows you to predict what you'll have for lunch on Thursday three years from now because it says, you know, if David does this every three weeks and does that every two weeks and does this as an algorithm, it's good to actually work it out with a very, a very um, high level of accuracy. So predictive search allows us to see how much um, we are like an algorithm in itself. So, we, you know, we, we act according to certain impulses. That's awesome. And I think this is a good segue into our plus two takeaway. Okay. So here's my official, here's my plus two takeaway sign. It's very, very high tech. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> at, at one time we had something that it was high marched, tech. It marched across my screen. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I had to work out the timing just right. Oh, my gosh. Perfect. Oh, I love it. So our plus two takeaway is some sort of a fun demonstration, a way to really bring home everything that we've been talking about. And we've been talking a lot about semantic search, and we've really... Um, spent some, s oh, all right, whatever. We spent a lot of time, <laughs> and it, we got really specific. Let's do a demonstration. <laughs> okay, okay. Before we even start, let me explain a little bit about, in, in sort of, in very, very briefly, what semantic search really means. It means that search is using an incredibly rich and dense number of signals um, from us, and it matches it to a very deep and detailed understanding of content across the web to actually give us a reply almost as nuanced as a person would. That's what semantic search is at its simplest form. So it's a matching of information to the intent of the query. Okay. So um, there are a couple of examples we can do, which are pretty good. The, the easiest one perhaps is conversational search. So um, if we do conversational search, and for that probably we need an Android device because we can talk into it. Uh, and you can actually um, ask the Android device um, for things like, what's the weather like? And it will probably give you the, well, it will actually give you the weather. It will tell you the weather at your location, wherever you may be. So, you know, I did it, you know, when I do it in Britain, it tells me, I mean, it tells me the same thing it tells me every day. It's rainy. <laughs> no, and that's that Seattle. Tell you when you visit Seattle, <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> well, you know, I should feel right at home then. Um, but you know, I did it in New York when I was in New York, and I said, "What's it?" Because you know, I wasn't familiar with New York weather. I said, "You know, what's the weather like?" And it told me what the weather was like. And even, even better, because the day before I had done an internet search on my desktop about the Empire State Building, so I thought, you know, I need to go there as soon as I get a chance. So I fire up Google now, and I say the first thing I see, it tells me, Empire State Building, 15 minutes away from where I was. I thought, this is awesome. This is really, really cool. And it actually gave me that on a chance that I would actually be interested to know where the Empire State Building was in, in terms of the location. Now, that kind of interfacing with technology is almost like technology is becoming, what do, we, what do we want technology to do to assist us? And normally, we had to do work for that to happen. You know, you have to go into your car, open the door, turn on the engine, check the mirror, wait for the engine to warm up. I mean, how much better would it be if your car actually knew that at 7.45 you're going to be there, the car engine is warmed up, 
the door opens automatically for you as you approach. You need to sit down. I mean, that, that's a lot better, right? Now that's, that's the kind of technology we need to go towards. And, and this is what's happening with search. It's actually getting to the point where it understands almost what we want to do and then tries to um, think ahead of it for us in order mm -hmm. to help us do it. But Hummingbird does a lot of other things. When it has a kind of reach um, connection, and then it allows us to do things like perhaps, you know, um, I drink a lot of coffee, like a lot of coffee, but also drink a lot of tea. So if you go, you know, Hummingbird now understands words like versus. So if you put on, on desktop coffee versus tea, immediately you get the calorific values and all the good the nutrients of each one. It's a comparison test. Let's see if this is working. And look at that. <laughs> yes. And you can even do a, nonsens a nonsensical comparison, like milk versus water. Like, I don't know if anybody would do that, but I'm, it would probably come up and give us something milk. which versus water. All right. Oh, there so. you go. I, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's more fat. In, I mean, it's a fact, right? There's more fat in milk than in water. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's terrific. Um, well, how about if we can we can we do the weather in Seattle versus Oops. the weather in? What Try that. I mean, eventually you'll be able to do that. I mean, the signals that you need to actually. This is the thing about some. I mean, definitely, let's try it and see what happens. Um, okay. So, how should I do it? Or I guess more. Washington to Greece. I don't know how specific we should. Well, be. let's try. Let's try a couple of cities. Let's try Seattle to Athens. Uh, Seattle versus Athens, okay. and see if we can get a comparison. Okay. Athens, Greece. Okay, let's let's. Okay. Okay, Athens. There you go. Comes up. Greece. Yeah. All right. So there's a flight there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and, and this is actually this is I'm, I'm very glad we did this because now here what what is happening is search is trying to understand what we're doing. It is not yet sufficiently rich in terms of the knowledge it has. It's still building up, and let's not forget semantic search essentially is less than a year old. You know, we're not even there yet. So it, it takes an enormous amount of information to actually carry out these comparisons. But it's getting there with every every step of the way. Sugar versus vinegar. That's pretty yeah. cool because because vinegar, I mean this is interesting because vinegar was actually misspelled. So the searchers actually actually understood what yeah. we needed. No, 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 don't worry. I love, I, no. I love it. It was I love totally that. planned that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, Scott, I'll, I must admit that before Google, my spelling used to be pretty spot on. And these days, you know, I just have, I have to Google some of the most ridiculous words sometimes, thinking, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just remember? But I've sort of given it up. You know, I, I just go to Google and it gives me the right spelling of words. So it's one of these, uh, it's, a, it's a decision we make about, about transactive memory and, and uh, learning. So essentially, transactive memory is how we um, learn things and we remember what they are, in order to learn more than we know, sometimes we don't need to know what we know as long as we know where to access it. And, and Google very much does that. So it allows and us to... And our brains adapt to that very well. I mean, yes. right, yeah. in my house, I have specific things I do. Ryan, my husband, has specific things he does. And I have no idea how I would do anything he does if he went out of town. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is it, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about this as it's a, a learned behavior, but for those of, uh, like our children who are growing up, uh, just as um, two and a half year old and my 14 year old, it's, it's the new norm. It's yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for them, they don't have to think about it the way we do. But let's, uh, what is interesting about talking about hummingbird now and, uh, and behavior, let's do something which is very generic. And let's type pizza restaurants, which is a very generic term. All right. I have to get back to the thing. So, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. PI. Type... Okay, now this is very, very generic because all you're doing is typing pizza restaurants and nothing else. Okay. And now you can see that it's actually trying to understand what you want. It's giving you some on Kent and some in, in, um, in Washington. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Now, if you type pizza restaurants near me. Oh. Ah. It's going to change. Voila. Or not. Or not, yes. It's well, you get, uh, you get Pizza Hut locations. Now, it's really, it's really interesting because in the UK, if I do that, if I would type pizza restaurants, I actually 
um, because the UK index is not as, as rich yet as um, Google.com. So I get a small search box directly under the search, which asks me to find a pizza restaurant in its location. So I need to put in the city. So what's happening there is search is actually learning from my query. So it's learning where I am. And uh, in the moment I say Manchester, for instance, or Stockport, or you know uh, London, if I'm in London, then it begins to refine it. Next time I put pizza restaurants near me, it uses the previous locations trying to guess where I am and tries to give me the same sort of, um, of content. And this is, again, part of the signals which are being mined. I mean, search can't really work well without us. It needs our signals. It needs our information in order to be able to um, understand our intent and refine the terms which come in. Which is, but it's learning all the time. It's getting better all the time. And we're helping it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find your. I'm trying to find your uh, favorite restaurant. Any of these uh, look familiar to you? Well, I <laughs> no. I must admit, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm terrible. I go to Pizza Hut. It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go back to our. She'd be able to oh, see it in, she's back. Uh, she's back. in playback. She was, so, okay. she was, she was we'll, quick. We'll, we'll change the subject again. <laughs> Hi, Jess. We were not Welcome talking back. about you, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I might have time to edit that out, David, so we're, I think we'll be safe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you very I was just much. Saying, I was just saying that uh, you know I, I wasn't looking at the screen and I was saying well we're about ready to uh, wrap up the hour and I looked up and then you were gone and I knew why we were running not on time because we didn't. <laughs> Jess is the one who keeps us uh, in line so I do and I apologize my um in backwards where I can't get high speed internet so I was using my phone and it was not plugged in uh, and I ran out of juice which means I ran out of internet connection so I had to change <laughs> oh the fragility of our technology right I know well and you know what and I embrace it and just go all right this is the way that it is today and tomorrow <laughs> it'll be a, just a different experience <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. So you finished your um, the demonstration? We yes, did. we did. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, if that's the case, then let me hold on. I gotta get back to where I was. I want to say thank you very much. And I, uh, David, it's been a real pleasure. And we have a special. Did you already show this? Scott, Not yet. Did I miss it? No. Oh, okay. So this is this is a special treat for you, and um, <laughs> we okay. want to know our way of saying thank you and thank you everybody for watching us. Oh wow! <laughs> Hi, David Amelhans. Google Semantic Search is probably one of the most challenging and thought-provoking books that I've read in quite a while. If you as a, as a reader are interested in taking a glimpse into the future, a future where that whole trying to become the number one on Google no longer matters, then you actually do need to read David Amelan's book because it will challenge you to think differently. It will challenge you to look at your clients through different eyes and it will challenge you to put, um, approach your business in a different way. Hello, I'm Mark Timberlake from Business Photography and Videography and this is a short review on David Amelin's book, Google Semantic Search. This book explains what semantic search is. It explains where it's come from and it explains its importance. No matter what your level of reading is, you're going to go into this book and come out the other end understanding what semantic search is. But most importantly of all, 
you're going to understand where your marketing needs to shift online. You're going to understand what your business needs to do. And you're going to understand what culture change you need to adopt to really take advantage of semantic search. We've gone through the book, we've read the book, and it's changed the way we market, it's changed the way we view the internet. But most importantly of all, we now know what it is we have to do. Hi, my name's Gina Fidel, and I'm here to say a few things about David Ammerland's book, Google Semantic Search. It's an illuminating practical guide and teaching tool for search and how that's evolving. He's teaching us how to regard the combined effects of our intents and our actions and how these come together for marketing. These concepts are critical and really mandatory for any business. Meanwhile, the breadth of the book is striking. From the contextual history of search to practical how-tos and checklists and natural topics such as the move to semantic search, what is semantic search, how is Google providing answers to our search queries and how will that continue to evolve? How can we supply the information that Google needs? And what is today's SEO? Trust and author rank, content marketing, where does social media fit in, and even how to work with an SEO agency today. All of these things, how they work together towards your success online are covered in the book. It's a text that will remain fresh and that we'll refer to over and over again, continually finding useful takeaways. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you very much, both of you. I was surprised. You're very welcome, David. Good night and good morning. Thank you. Bye-bye.